Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I wanted to welcome you to our Aspetuck Land Trust Lunch and Learn series. Um, today, we have uh, two special guests from the Connecticut Department of Transportation who are going to share with us some of the great work that they've done um, with transforming our uh, state road landscapes into native plant pollinator um, habitat. And uh, so this is a really exciting opportunity from, uh, for us to hear from them. Before I introduce them, I just wanted to give you a little bit of instruction on today's webinar and uh, also show a brief video. So um, your cameras, your audios and vi uh, videos have been uh, turned off. So you can ask questions as we go along um, using the Q&A or the chat. Um, and we will be curating the questions as they come in, and we will ask them uh, of our guests at the end of their presentation. So um, uh, hopefully that works for everybody. And um, the Aspetuck Land Trust Lunch and Learn uh, series is uh, an opportunity for people to um, learn about ways they can transform their own yards um, and use uh, ecologically friendly means, uh, organic land care, to include natives in their pro on their properties and rethink their lawns. And those are the three pillars of the Aspetuck Land Trust Green Corridor. And um, the concept of corridors and allowing species to move across the landscape is critically important um, as we uh, are facing climate change and, and declines in biodiversity. So the talk today is so important because not only do we have corridors and pathways um, that we are doing in our yards, but our largest landowner, the Department of Transportation, is doing it too. So our transportation corridors are also turning into pollinator corridors. So I just wanted to take the next three minutes and share with you uh, a really great video that gives you an idea of why why the Green Corridor is so important. So I'm going to um, share my screen and start this video as we uh, allow other people to begin to roll in. So um, let's see if I can do this. Imagine a Fairfield County where the beauty of our land is preserved, where birds and insects flourish and natural species thrive where people have more preserved lands to enjoy, drinking water is pure, and flooding is diminished. Here at Aspetuck Land Trust, we are making this happen and encouraging others to support our Green Corridor mission. Part one of the Green Corridor is protecting land. We are preserving strategically located land parcels in our six town region by either purchasing them or receiving them as donations. So far, this includes 42 parcels and over 800 acres of land. Among those are Gilberti's Farm and the Fromson Strassler property in Weston, where we are creating a 705 acre forest block on the Weston Wilton border. Part two of the Green Corridor is land stewardship, encouraging homeowners to keep their backyards sustainable. We are controlling the plants that are on our land. And right now we, we vastly favor giant lawns. We've got 40 million acres of lawn in this country. That's the size of New England. Uh, and, and particularly the way we treat our lawns, that's, that's a deadscape. Our lawns don't provide food webs that support all the other things that we, we need. So what we wanna do is re-landscape our yards. I suggest we cut the area of lawn in half, put in the plants that support the food webs and the pollinators and create uh, what we, we call biological corridors that connect the actual habitats so that the plants and animals in those habitats not only can move back and forth between habitats, uh, but they can actually live outside those habitats. Now, the Green Corridor Initiative from the Aspetuck Land Trust uh, is organizing an effort to create the biological corridors that, that we talked about. Of course, the corridor will be much more effective if everybody joins up. If you have holes in it, that's you know, that's an obstruction. And it, you know, it's not hard. Put that oak tree in your yard and, and instead of the ginkgo. And all of a sudden you've got connectivity with, with migrating birds and countless other species. We are in a critical moment in time to save our species and protect our natural lands. 
insect populations have declined by 40% since the 1970s, and we've lost 3 billion birds since that time. And as population growth swells in America's suburbs, so does harmful development. Creating a greener planet starts with greener suburbs and greener backyards. Great. Um, yeah, I always love that video and uh, I love Melissa Newman's voice on it. I think it's very great. But I, I think this gives you an idea of why it's so important um, that we all work together to create these habitats that um, will bring our species back into our backyards and on these corridors. So um, I would like to take this opportunity now to uh, welcome, and you can hear my cat in the background, I'm sorry, um, to welcome our speakers today. Uh, we have Adam Boone, um, who uh, works for the Department of Transportation. He is the transportation landscape design uh, designer for the DOT. Um, and Adam is also a licensed arborist. Um, and then we have uh, Kevin Karifa, who is the transportation supervising planner for the Department of Transportation. Um, and they have a great presentation for us today um, about the, the work that they're doing across our state of Connecticut to enhance pollinator habitat. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Kevin and Adam. You can start to share your screen. Great, thank you. Okay. Right. One second. Uh, we are. Let me let me know, folks, when you can see our PowerPoint. Yes. Perfect. Great. All right. Can, can everyone hear us? Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. We're really appreciative of your uh, interest and your support for our pollinator program. And this is Adam Boone. I'm gonna start off with uh, several slides to share what maintenance has been doing the last few years. And then at some point uh, midstream or so, I'll turn it over to Kevin for uh, to share what construction has been doing. <clears throat> He's an assistant director in the Office of Environmental Planning and uh, construction actually has been doing this for quite a few years, uh, actually before our program even started. So it, of course it made sense to incorporate what they're doing and had already been doing uh, into our program. So he'll be sharing that in a little bit. I don't know that you need to. You folks can see our screen, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay, very okay, good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just double check about that. We got a notice here. We had a check on. <clears throat> so so we started in 2017 and there we go. Sorry folks. <laughs> we started in 2017 in response to Public Act 1617. Uh, this is the federal act for pollinator health and uh, Connecticut established our own Public Act 1617. And uh, so the, within the act, we were to identify um, opportunities to replace cool season turf grasses with native plant communities that include model pollinator habitat. Uh, it also required that we seek opportunities to establish pollinator habitat along the highway system. And further that we submit a report with information concerning the timetable for replacements, the locations, dimensions, and whether there was availability of federal funds for this work. So we submitted the reports and here we go. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the cover page of that report. And while this was being worked on, we also were finishing our vegetation management guidelines. That's in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And uh, we finished that in February of 2018. And within these guidelines, it 
there's a chapter on pollinator, the pollinator program, but it also provides our forces with the uh, information they need and guidance on all matters pertaining to vegetation management along our right of ways. So in the process of starting the program and creating it, we researched materials from other states to see what they were doing and uh, to, to find out what, if any, there were any issues, uh, challenges or mistakes that they may have ran into and trying to learn from those as we were starting our program. Um, <clears throat> within that material that we were looking at, we were looking also within our own, uh, at our own Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, uh, their resources. So we've worked along the way, we've worked with DEP, uh, in particular with uh, Peter Pacone from DEEP and the Agriculture Experiment Station, Kim Stoner has been a big help to us and Yukon <clears throat> with John Campanelli at Yukon. And again, within our own ranks, uh, the Office of Envir Environmental Planning, Engineering, Construction and our own maintenance forces. So one of the first areas, and again, this was right before uh, we actually officially started our program. This was in 2016. This was a great opportunity to kind of start something here that we hadn't tried before. The uh, gas company, there was a gas company that was running a main right through the Danbury rest area and welcome center. So this area was all torn up and everything. And within the permit process and the restoration process, we required them and, and they were more than willing to, we required them to establish a pollinator corridor. And, excuse me, it ended up being around 25 feet wide by 150 feet long. And of course they, they established it, they planted it. We put out the signs here. These were one of our original sign designs. Uh, these have since been upgraded, but, um, so again, this was a great opportunity to get our feet wet, so to speak with establishing a pollinator area. Now within this photo, you'll see that, of course, you'll see the cone flower, but there's also mugwort in here that um, unfortunately this, this area has, uh, this whole area besides just the pollinator area has a underground uh, sprinkler system. And um, it was, let's just say it was overwatered <laughs> and that mugwort really took off in this area. And to the point where we've had to, last year we worked diligently on uh, reining this in. So, and we continue to work at it, uh, spot treating mugwort to try to uh, manage it in this location. So we're trying to turn that around and, and, you know, improve on that location, but it's still there. And again, it has our newer signs there as well. So again, we started officially in the spring of 2017 uh, we came up with three strategies, which were plant replacement plots, reduced mowing, and construction projects. On the upper right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see a location we were working on last year. This is the Southington Rest Area right along 84. This was kind of interesting because we took, we're trying something there by just taking plants from uh, nearby right-of-ways and just, we dug them up and we transplanted them in this location and the uh, rest area attendant here is watering them and taking care of them weeding and so forth. So this is a, something we're gonna try. And, you know, we have wildflowers all over our right of ways and why not, uh, especially when they have a nice established root system, why not move them into other locations as well where people see them more uh, readily. So we came up with initially eight locations and uh, some may know, but we have four districts for maintenance. We have four districts throughout the state. Within those districts, there's two sections. So basically that's how we came up with the eight, two locations per district. And you'll notice um, for the locations, you'll notice a brief description at the bottom, approximate size of the locations, what district they're in and so forth. And whether they were naturalized that has an N next to it or planted and has a P next to it. So within each district, we chose one location to leave naturalized where 
we would only mow the shoulder of the highway. And if we had access and the, the ground permitted it, we would mow the perimeter of the location, but leave the whole interior alone, just simply reduce the mowing in that area. And of course the planted ones, we chose one of those per, per district as well, where we would seed those locations. So this is one of the locations. This was in district three down in Trumbull, the uh, route eight median. And as you can see, we treated the interior area. This is a pretty long corridor through here. This is right by exit 11. And uh, of course we left the shoulders alone on both sides. It's about a 15 foot shoulder, which is our general practice along the highways is to, for safety purposes and visibility of signs. So we treated the middle area, mowed it down so that we could uh, get good access and good uh, seed contact. And then this is, again, this is with the help of Deep with uh, Peter Bacone, we used their tractor and Truax Cedar. And we provided the transportation to move the machine from location to location. Um, so yeah, we seeded this area in uh, the spring of 2017. And just zipping ahead a few years, this was in 2020 a general look at the area. So some of the things came in pretty well. Uh, Minarda came in pretty good. We had some uh, bush clover and uh, the Penstemon digitalis came in pretty good as well. So we're monitoring this site and uh, in the future we may need to uh, uh, oversee, we may need to do some things in here, but overall it looks pretty good. This is an area and this is just to show you what uh, reduced mowing, what our reduced mowing practices accomplishes in many places. As you can see, this is 84 in uh, the Tolland area, exit 67. And you can see the shoulder was mowed here. And then right behind behind that, you see the uh, Joe Pye weed and goldenrod and so forth. This is, uh, slopes down in here a little bit. But this is what we see in a lot of places along our highways where we've reduced the mowing practices and it's a this is a great spot this isn't actually one of our designated areas but I chose this because it's it's a really beautiful picture and it's just a an example I'll show some more here of what you can get by reducing your mowing and a few years ago I found a quote by Jeff Castor in Florida the Florida DOT where he said the wildflowers are already there we just need to stop mowing them down and we have found that to be very true along the highways. There's a seed bank already there, but if we mow too often, of course, your flowers, uh, your, your, your plants can't come up. They can't set a flower and set seed and propagate themselves. It's, the mowing is just too frequent. So again, we have found this to be really true along the highways and we're enjoying the benefit of that. The bottom part of this talks a little bit about our mowing program and so when I mentioned a shoulder mow or shoulder cut, it's a 15 foot swath along the edge of the highway, whether it's north, south, east, west. Um, and again, that's for safety and for a little area for recovery, but it's also for sign visibility. And it provides some definition for these interior areas that are not mowed. We also mow where we can, again, where the ground permits it. We mow the perimeter of uh, these uh, wide areas as well. Now, wide areas in our uh, in our mowing um, in our mowing program, when we say wide areas, it's basically anything 60 feet or wider. And we we came up with that because, for instance, on a highway median, if you have a 15 foot shoulder mow on either side, east west, we'll say, and then that allows you a 30 foot center section to reduce your mowing or to seed and so forth. Anything less than 30 feet at highway speeds just looked, it was too narrow and it didn't look right. It, it just, it wasn't really appropriate. So again, when I say wide areas, I'm referring to uh, medians or ramp or core areas that are over 60 feet in width. So just a few examples of, of uh, reduced mowing and uh, perimeter mows. This was, this is uh, the exit 11, <clears throat> Route 9 southbound in Middletown. And you can see here where we've mowed behind the guide rail. And then you see along the highway where we've mowed the shoulder there. And this is a patch of milkweed 
that uh, has been there for quite a while now and each year it just develops further and further, which is uh, the whole intent and it's working out really well here. And this is along the Merritt Parkway, median area. Uh, this whole patch is milkweed. And this can be found, this is a pretty condensed patch. It's really, a, I should say a dense patch, but uh, it can be found in many places along the Merritt Parkway. And it's simply by reducing our mowing that uh, these areas were not planted. It's just by reducing the mowing that these are able to uh, come up and propagate themselves. So the programs, uh, they're getting quite a bit of recognition and we really appreciate that. Um, whether by the governor, it's on uh, social media and, and different outlets. And again, we really appreciate the uh, interest and the support. We added, um, it's expanded rapidly over the last few years. Again, we started in 2017, 2019, we added 50 sites. And last year we added an additional 18 and we intend to add more even this year. I just, I don't have an exact number just yet, but we are gonna be adding more sites this year. It's, uh, it comprises about 150 acres right now of set aside, uh, set aside conservation areas. So everything that we have so far is on GIS. We've been using ARC GIS. Um, Every location on here is uh, symbolized by a monarch butterfly. This is a rather zoomed out picture, but uh, if you'll notice, you'll see the total number here shows 111 locations. Now, just to clarify, some of these locations have, we drew several polygons for some of the locations. So it's within GIS, it's adding it up to be more than the 80, but uh, just so you know what that's about. And again, it's around 150 acres. Now I will say this is a rather conservative number because we have a lot of a lot of locations that are not designated. They're not within the 80 locations that we have reduced our mowing in those areas as well because they're over 60 feet in width. So we have actually significantly more than 150 acres set aside by practice. It's just not so much within the program itself. And just to zoom in a little more, this is one of the locations in Mansfield. This is Super 6. Uh, there's quite a few locations in the median out here and uh, ramp areas and also on the shoulders. And to zoom in a little more, you'll see the polygons. And just wanted to show you the inspection feature also within, the, uh, within GIS. So we're able to track, we're able to monitor activity out there we're able to track the condition of the locations, what's what's transpiring there, uh, whether woody invasives or other herbaceous invasives are getting in there and taking over. So we can go in and just plug in when we visited, uh, what we found, what work needs to be done, what work has been done, and it's, it's proven to be a great tool for us. I'm gonna turn it over now to Kevin, and he's gonna share what uh, construction's been doing for quite a few years now, actually. Thank you, Adam, and uh, good afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna to touch on what our design and construction projects uh, are starting to do and continue to do to help uh, the Department of Transportation's pollinator program in which uh, Adam has been sharing with you. Um, I'd just like to point out that the, the teams from the Connecticut DOT side involved with developing pollinator opportunities with our capital program projects are engineering, construction, environmental planning, and maintenance. As uh, Adam had mentioned uh, on the previous slides, you know, pollinator plants have been included in construction project plans for quite some time. Um, it, it, it is not a uh, a newer practice for us. It, it's a practice we've been doing for some years and uh, I, I like to show you folks some of the stuff that are achievements that we, we are working on. Um, typically plants are conducted for restoring the Department of Transportation right away in a highway corridor uh, within regulated areas such as wetlands, water courses, or if the department's required to do compensatory mitigation um, that's required by the Army Corps or the Connecticut DEP. Um, and we do this uh, obviously for our design and construction projects. 
Uh, I'm going to touch on a few project examples in the next few slides of where we're starting to see uh, pollinator plants thrive a year after uh, a design and construction project was completed. So here is a project. It, it was a multi-use pr uh, project that DOT designed and constructed. Um, it is a multi-use trail in the town of Manchester and Bolton. It is adjacent to I-384. This area is the exit five. It is the, um, I believe it is the, uh, the eastbound uh, location of the project. Um, so during the uh, design of this project, um, you know, that being a multi-use trail along an interstate highway, um, there was uh, wetland watercourse impacts. There was a pretty extensive planting plan developed as part of this project. Um, during this design, uh, there were some concerns that were noted uh, when the folks from our maintenance office was reviewing you know, the plantings for the project and what seed mixes we were going to utilize for the project. Um, they were a little concerned about this, this area and obviously some area, other areas uh, throughout the corridor. Um, you know, we have a multi-use trail right adjacent to a major interstate highway. Um, you know, as you see in this picture here, you see the trail uh, to the far left with chain link fence. And then you have an area where we had, you know, disturbance that was right next to uh, the, the interchange um, and the guide rail. So maintenance was a little concerned because, you know, originally the thought was to just, you know, do our traditional turf establishment, uh, use, utilizing our uh, turf establishment seed mix. And what the concerns maintenance had brought up to the design teams was, hey, this area is gonna be very problematic from us from a maintenance and operations standpoint. We are going, we, we don't have the ability to get into this area with a piece of mowing equipment. We would need to take a, a, a lane, uh, shut the ramp down um, in order to have maintainers go in there and utilize weed whackers to take down the vegetation. So the idea was why not utilize a pollinator seed mix um, and that idea was implemented. And as you can see here, this is a year following construction. You could see the sea of black eyed Susans that are just you know, taking fold within this area. And quite honestly, it, it really is nice to see that. And again, it's just one of those techniques and working together as you know, within the department to figure out a way to help maintenance. But on the other hand, it's also promoting the pollinator program. Here's the same uh, project. This is part of the trail. Um, this was an embankment that was adjacent leading down to I-384. Um, this was another steep embankment. And the idea here was, you know, what could we do to help out maintenance, um, you know, an area where they, you know, would have to be responsible for maintaining and how would they get a piece of mowing equipment in, in this area. So once again, an idea came up was why don't we utilize this area when we're restoring the site um, to use, you know, topsoil and to place our uh, place a pollinator type seed mix down. And again, you, you we see a year later some really great results with uh, black eyed Susans uh, just being fully engulfed in this area. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about what we do on the wetland creation side of things. Um, we do, we look at wetland creation sites and we're required to do wetland creation sites. Um, uh, it's a requirement, you know, as part of um, Army Corps compensation and, and DEP uh, compensation when we impact uh, inland wetlands and watercourses as, as well as tidal wetlands and watercourses uh, on our projects. So here's a project example. It was a bridge, bridge replacement down in East Lyme. Uh, it was Route 1 over the Niantic River as part of this project. It was a full bridge replacement. We had impacts, tidal wetland impacts, to tidal wetland vegetation, uh, watercourse impacts as well too. Um, as part of the compensatory mitigation as part of this project, we were required to create a tidal wetland within this area as part of the project here, as you can see. Um, when we do these creation sites, we utilize native plantings. Um, we utilize uh, native topsoil um, to create a wetland topsoil um, for the area. In this photograph here, you see some white flowering shrubs that is high tide bush. Also within the site, just beyond where the white flowers are is uh, goldenrod. And again, those are just some of the tidal wetland plants we utilize to re really restore, um, you know, and recreate wetlands for our projects that require uh, 
regulatory permits. Um, I just want to point out on some of our older mitigation site over the last 20 years or so, um, you know, this has been something, you know, we've been doing for, for some time. It's not nothing new. Um, you know, over 20 years ago, we, you know, we created along Route 6 in Brooklyn. We were doing a safety improvement project. And as part of that project, we created a wet metal. And again, it's, uh, you know, it's the things that the techniques we're using as far as wetland topsoil goes um, and utilizing a native planting plan and seed mixes, it really reestablishes the lost uh, wetland you know, impacts, but it's also promoting the pollinators on the other side of things. Um, Another project example is uh, as part of the Connecticut uh, CT Fast Track project, we were required to uh, create a quite large mitigation site on the Flatbush Avenue uh, off ramp uh, within, you know, in Hartford. Um, that's just another good project example, just to show where we're utilizing uh, native native seed mixes and native planting plants. Uh, another coastal project example is the Moses Wheeler Bridge project where we were required to restore tidal wetlands um, on that. Again, you know, like I said, uh, the seed mixes are used on site. Um, the DOT has various seed mixes uh, that we, through the years, have created and amended and upgraded to make it better. We have a conservation seeding for slopes, what are primarily used for the steep slope areas and areas adjacent to regulated areas such as wetlands and water courses. We also have a grass uh, shoreline grass establishment that is utilized um, in our more coastal tidal areas um, and has more tolerable type plants uh, applicable to those areas. Another uh, mitigation uh, strategy that DOT is involved with as it relates to design and construction projects is um, the work we do that associates uh, that, that anytime we're, we're dealing with doing in water work, uh, working in river systems. Um, a great project example is the I-84 reconstruction project that was just recently completed a, part about a year or two ago in Waterbury. Um, as part of that project, uh, you know, we had a major reconstruction project widening. We, as part of the project, it required um, a lot of, uh, you know, layout with fixing curves that were there and everything. And, and as part of all that, we were, you know, we had to move some major river systems. One that comes to mind is the Mad River and the other one is Beaver Pond Brook, where we had some very, we had extensive major re relocation in order to straighten out I-84 and add the lanes as part of the project. Um, Anytime we're dealing with doing any sort of restoration work on streams, uh, we utilize techniques as far as uh, recreating repairing shelves. Um, as part of recreating those shelves, we utilize um, you know topsoil, wetland topsoil, um, and we utilize native plantings and seed mixes. Uh, typically, on the most part of these repairing shelves, we're utilizing uh, various types of willows, uh, dogwoods. Um, and again, you know, in order to uh, reseed the areas and revegetate them, we have, again, the conservation seeding for slopes spec we use, but we also do have a floodplain seed mix uh, specification that does include various types of wildflowers within that mix. Um, so again, it's just another, um, you know, another contributing factor we've been doing for, for certain white times. Uh, again, we've been doing it on the wetland creation side of things, both inland and tidal, and we're also doing it as we're working on river system to, to basically restore those, those areas. Um, here is a project example. This is out in Pomfret, Connecticut, Route 44 over Bark Meadow Brook. As a result of this project, it was a full bridge replacement. And again, you know, when we are working on and doing the design for projects, we're taking into, into account, you know, what, how much area we need for construction um, in order to demo the existing structure and put in a new structure. Um, you know, we try to minimize wherever we can uh, to minimize our regular, you know, our uh, regulated impacts for projects, but there are, there are, there are projects where it's just unavoidable. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have to look at ways to restore those areas after we're, the project is completed. So again, in this project, um, where you see the sign where it says Bark Meadow Brook, um, these were these were areas that was impacted by the project. It was a wetland area. We utilized uh, conservation wetland seed mix to restore this area. And we also had a pretty robust uh, 
planting plan that consists of mostly uh, uh, dogwoods and willows. Here's another project example. This is in East Haddam. This is Route 82 over Hemlock Valley Brook. Again, a, a major, uh, it was a full bridge replacement project. As you can see in this photograph here, you see a, a stump. Uh, obviously the tree was cut and the stump's still intact. Those are just some techniques we utilize when we get, when these projects do get into construction um, and the oversight working with the, the various, uh, you know, DOT personnel and the contractor. We look at ways to minimize our clearing limits. Um, and again, there's, there's, there's situations where we, we might be unavoidable or, and we have to you know, over clear or it's within our footprint. But there's also techniques that we do utilize um, during our tree clearing walkthrough to see what you know, can be salvaged. So here's a perfect example. You see the stream, you see the, uh, the, the left intact stump. Um, you know, that's stuff we look at. Um, we, we had impact from DEP and Army Corps to basically fully take out the stump in that whole area. But while we got to construction, working with the contract and district, we said, hey, let's, let's try to maintain and keep this stump. Obviously the areas around it, you can see the, the river stone um, and you can see actually clusters of black eyed Susan and just beyond that area is uh, Joe Pieweed. So, that area was disturbed. We had uh, water handling coffer dams in place to uh, demo the existing structure and isolate the stream from where the work was, the activity was taking place. Um, but what we were able to do is save the stump and topsoil around it and throw a little bit of our, uh, our great seed mixes that we use. And it was a wetland seed mix, again, that, that contained uh, various types of pollinator plants. And, and again, you can see it in this photograph with the black eyed Susans and the Joe Pie weed. I just want to talk briefly on, uh, you know, some of the things we're moving forward on and collaborating with our maintenance folks and, of course, the rest of the folks within DOT. Um, we do have a wildflower establishment specification that we developed. It's been out since 2017. We have updated various times. Um, we do, at first, we used to call out what types of seeds specifically and what we wanted into it, but then we were having some issues with contractors trying to put the specific type of seed together and we weren't just getting a great product. So we took a step back and we started looking at, you know, New England wetlands, uh, New England wetland plants. Uh, we started looking at uh, various types of uh, suppliers from such as the Vermont wetland plant supply, Ernst's uh, conservation seeds. Um, it was just easier for us to call out those. And, you know, we called up three different types and then it's just, it's easier for the contractor to say, here's the material I'm using. And yes, this is approved. And we review that obviously when we get the construction. So um, a great, another project example, and it's a project that's a, an active construction project currently by the DOT, it's the I-91 Charter Oak uh, interchange project. It's termed as the Hartford project uh, that's currently going on. And a great success story there was, you know, and just showing a great example of the collaboration of DOT teams working together was, is part of that widening, um, we had to, you know, the designers came up with engineering slopes that are very steep. And again, during the design maintenance says, hey, how are we going to be able to maintain these very steep engineered slopes? It's just going to be very problematic for us to do. A lot of these slopes were in areas where right at the toe slope you had a wetland or water course um, or you had some sort of business or so on and so forth. So it was just a very difficult situation to do. So great, the great, the great idea that was proposed. And again, it was, you know, a kudos to our landscape design unit and uh, our maintenance uh, folks, especially Adam, that was part of that project review was, hey, why don't we take our conservation scene for slope spec? amend it to include more wildlife, more, um, more wildflowers within the, the seed mixture. And again, you know, just some of those things that they really targeted was milkweed, black eyed Susan, metal goldenrod, and purple coneflower um, within that seed mix to really make it robust. So we're really excited and uh, those, those engineered slopes were all turf established last year and Adam and myself and the rest of the folks from OEP uh, the Office of Environmental Planning and our Landscape Design Unit are really looking forward to see and assess how those engineered slopes are going to take form this year. And we're hoping that, you know, we can get a really another good success story out of that moving forward. 
Um, I just want to touch really quickly on what's called the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. This is turned as the CCAA. Um, so this has been out for a little while. Uh, it targets the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is getting very, it is getting very good attraction of being close to being a listed species. Um, and what this program is is really targeting if the monarch butterfly, you know, receives a listing as an endangered species. This agreement is intended to provide protection for maintenance operation for transportation agencies and utilities. So one thing that we're a little fuzzy on and it's a little bit unclear is that we're not sure if this agreement um, fully will cover um, our design and construction projects. One thing we do know, just reading up on it and just you know having some discussions with some of the neighboring states, uh, is that it, it seems to capture our maintenance operations side of things, but it, it's not 100% clear if it's capturing our design and construction projects individually. So you know, a few things that are part of this agreement um, and some things that the DOT is looking into is there's funding to join. Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at to, is funding to join this. Uh, another thing is there's monitoring reporting requirements tied to it. So we have not signed on to this. Um, my team, uh, along with some of the other folks within DOT are looking at what this would take the DOT to sign into. Um, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of uh, homework that we're doing currently. Um, one of our major thing is we don't really have available funding currently and really have geared up staff to be able to um, sign into this and do the monitoring and obviously pay into the program and to implement it. So like I said, my team's looking into it. And um, one of the biggest things that, you know, DOT struggles with and, and it's still a work in progress is, is the right of way. So as part of this agreement, you have to set aside a certain percentage of your right of way where you're gonna you're going to focus on saying, I'm leaving this area untouched and it's gonna to be to protect the monarch butterfly under the CCAA. We are still trying, we as a DOT is in the process of mapping all our right of way and still trying to figure out a lot of our agreements and easements. So that alone is a is a is a big task for us in hand. So you know, there, there's some things coming up in the near future that we're looking at. We're going to continue to look at and make a decision moving forward to, to join into this uh, agreement or not to join into it. What I want to just point out, regardless if the OT does not sign into this agreement, we feel from a department standpoint that we're doing a really good job um, because we're already set aside, as Adam showed you, I think we have over 100 locations um where they are being left alone for conservation and we feel that we're doing our due diligence uh with that and also what we're doing for our design and construction projects with that being said i'm going to turn it back over to adam so he can touch on some of the strategies dot would like to do moving forward all right thanks kevin yeah so moving forward we're going to we're going to Within maintenance, we're going to continue to uh, educate and train our own staff, uh, especially in the area of mowing operations. Uh, this has been, in the last few years, it's been a, quite an adjustment uh, for our mowing operators. After years of mowing pretty much everything, several, whatever, however they can get it done two or three times a year, um, it's quite a different strategy what we're uh, employing now. So they are adjusting and it's working. It's just, uh, Again, continuing to reinforce that. And uh, also with helping them to identify uh, locations where there are existing native, nice wildflowers. Um, the more they can identify those locations, the more they can intentionally mow around those and let those areas expand uh, within reason. Again, they can't be in areas where they're blocking sight distances or. Um, Again, within that shoulder mow area, we can't have that, but there are plenty of other locations where that would work well. Um, another thing I'm looking into is um, maybe some uh, applications that they can put on their phone that might help them with uh, plant ID. Uh, one of the things I was looking at just recently was PlantNet. And if anybody knows of that one or other ones that might be 
uh, of help to, to them, to all of us, that would be good if you want to throw it in the chat box. Another one, of course, is to continue to work with our partners, with Deep, the Ag Station, Yukon, and others. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's help, their guidance. Uh, I'm coming at this from a, a tree work, a tree industry background. So this has been a, an expansion of my working knowledge the last few years, and I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, input and uh, help and um, from where we can get it. <laughs> Uh, obviously, we've got to continue to manage invasive species. That's something all of us are working on and continue to work on. We want to uh, increase our locations and corridors for reduced mowing practices. Um, as well as that, we're looking into increasing uh, replacement plot locations, places where we can plant more. I have some ideas in mind for trial areas, one of them being right here in uh, Newington at our headquarters on the back slope behind our uh, behind our parking area, as well as a site out in Wellington along 84. And we are thinking in terms of uh, trying engineered soil media. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but we'd like to, we're looking into whether that could work for us. Um, as you know, tilling is not an option for us. Preparing the ground is not so much an option for us. We have stumps, we have soil that is um, not the best quality, not the best, uh, does not contain the best nutrient value. And so we're looking at other ways of um, putting something down that can contain the seeds that can actually provide the moisture and the nutrients that are needful for some for some time until the plants get established. Uh, another challenge we have is we're not able to water. We're not able to get out there and water these locations. So again, something we're looking into and just to keep you up to date on that. And local ecotype seed mixes. When we planted a few years ago, we used a seed mix out of Pennsylvania, and which is fine. It's just, you know, we're all looking for local ecotype seeds. And that's a popular topic right now. But, and of course, we're included in that, uh, in that group looking for local seed. So we're keeping a pulse on that and uh, staying up to date with what's available. <clears throat> We've increased our public outreach. You've probably seen uh, many things on Twitter and so forth. And um, you'll also see in here, these are our newer signs. We'll see these on these two slides here. There's several different slides. Uh, I'm sorry, several different sign types. But um, so as you saw earlier, the, the yellow sign, these are our newer signs that we're using all over the area. So if you see one of these signs, it means it's a designated conservation area. And we're also looking to update our vegetation management guidelines. I pointed that out earlier. Um, it's on our website and we're looking to update those. They were put out in 2018 and there's just a few things that need to be updated in there. So I trust that gets you kind of up to date with where we are and where we're trying to go. We really appreciate everybody joining today and we'll speak on behalf of myself and Kevin. Thank you all for, again, your interest, your support. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Kevin and Adam. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you can share your video um, feed, so this way we can start to ask some questions. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. And, you know, it's so encouraging uh, for us to know that driving, you know, these thousands of miles I, of, of state roads, uh, that people are going to be exposed to a new aesthetic for gardening, that they will see these plants um, uh, growing as they should be instead of just a mowed lawn. And uh, I think, um, you know, you highlighted beautifully how multi use these um, native plantings are for wetland remediation and stormwater management. And, you know, the, the Department of Transportation's major goal obviously is to keep uh, uh, all of us drivers safe. Um, and they also have to keep their maintenance um, folks um, safe as well. And, you know, having them drive mowers across to the median is, is an unsafe thing for them. So these changes in mowing practices are, you know, not only convenient, but they're safety factors for the DOT workers as well. So um, we have a, a couple of 
great questions that um, have come in. And so Abby, I'm gonna uh, let you, you've been curating them. Um, so I'm gonna let you uh, turn off your mute and then ask uh, Kevin and Adam the questions. Sure thing. So thank you both so much for all of your insight sure. and all of this. Thank you. So we do have a handful. So the first one um, has three parts. So let me know if you want me to repeat any of these parts, but this person wants to let you know that they appreciate the effort and focus on wildflowers and mowing. So they want to know, will Connecticut uh, DOT also be addressing removal of invasive burning bush? Is that a concern at all? Um, second one is, can there be potential replacement with native shrubs or is it more cost effective to convert to wildflowers? And lastly, how would a town, specifically Old Lyme, Exit 70, go about getting a, on a priority list for uh, unanimous removal? Um, yeah, you, Uanimous is a uh, certainly an invasive that we all are challenged with. Um, it's more it seems more rampant in some places than others, but it is uh, one of many for us. It's autumn olive is another really common one for us, but um, I can certainly look at that exit. What is it? Exit seventy was the location. Yep. The line. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the 156 156 just that yeah uh, Baldwin bridge so yeah we can look at that location and uh see what's warranted there whether cutting down and stump tree kind of a thing is warranted there um that is near the river but i, I think that exit 70 should be plenty of distance away so that should be fine what was the last part i'm sorry abby Give sure question. So, yep. um yes yeah, so that last one is uh, is there potential for placement with native shrubs, or are you mostly looking to wildflowers and perennials um, because it's more cost effective? Or what's the thought process there? Again, I'd have to look at that location to see what's warranted uh, once we, uh, if we were to seek to remove that you want us there. Okay, great. And then the next one, someone is just curious if you could spell the app that you use again, PlantNet. Is that, could you just spell that out loud for them? Yes, uh, P as in Patrick, L-A-N-T-N-E-T, -N -N -E one word. That's just one that I've been looking at. Um, it's, uh, it's rated pretty well. I don't know if others know of others or better ones for uh, both. I'm, we're looking specifically for Northeast wildflowers, but um, this does uh, both wildflowers and invasives. Both of those would be helpful for our field forces. Okay, great. And then another question is, what is the mowing policy on state highways? So as uh, I mentioned briefly earlier, so areas that are over 60 feet in width. So this might be on a median area. There are shoulders here and there that widen out. Um, ramp areas, gore areas. Again, if they're over 60 feet in width, you'll notice that we're mowing the shoulders and the perimeter of the area. So for instance, if it's a shoulder, we'll mow along the woods line. And again, it's around 15 feet. And this just gives a definition. It also provides, um, it minimizes the encroachment of the woods into the meadow area. So it manages that for us. And again, gives definition. Of course, along the highway, we need that 15 foot shoulder for safety purposes. Okay, great. And then someone also uh, is asking, as someone who drives in the merit frequently, I noticed that you treat, she's guessing Roundup under the guardrails. Um, so there's one other person that's asking a related question. So are you planning on reducing this over the last couple of years or have you reduced it? And then are there alternatives that you're looking to for this as well? Yes, along the merit, actually along all of our highways, we use a prescription actually. It's a prescription that uh, is, is pretty fine tuned because we need, we only treat these one time a year. So, and it's the summer months. Uh, sometimes it's in June. Our program basically runs through, uh, usually we finish mid August. So in June, you have things that still haven't come up yet, pre-emergent, and then you have of course, in August, later, pretty much everything's in by then and going the other way around. So we have a prescription that addresses both pre-emergence and post-emergence. 
And we also have things in the prescription to address some of the woody. Um, here and there we have the um, poison ivy and that type of thing, creepers that try to come up along the guide rail and timber rail in this case. So, and it's a three to five foot swath, if that helps anybody. It's a very pretty narrow swath that we're trying to uh, manage underneath the guide rails. The other thing I want to point out is it's, um, it's a management strategy. It's not an eradication strategy. So our problem is if we, if we were to go aggressive and try to eradicate, then we're into washouts and erosion and so forth. So it literally is a one-time program each year to manage the vegetation under the rail. And typically it, it's, it's all back the following year. We spray the same places every year. So again, it's just a testament of how little we're using and how non-toxic it is really. Um, and it doesn't leach. I can, there's areas where you, we have really steep slopes and the products we're using stay right on the top. They don't get on the slope at all. So I hope that helps you a little bit with that program. And then I think this is a related question. This might be related, um, but what else is being used to reduce invasives or what is being done to reduce invasives? Um, again, we can't really reduce them in the sense of, you know, stop that from happening. But we, within the areas, uh, you know, especially these designated areas, we are, uh, you know, spot treating. And, and again, GIS is helping us by just going out and locating these areas. Our own forces, as they learn to identify, they're pointing out areas to us as well. Um, I have areas that people have been pointing out for bamboo that we've been going after, uh, running bamboo, which is a very challenging plant. So, um, again, we're just doing the best we can to manage. We can't really eradicate, we can't prevent things from happening. Okay, great. Um, someone else has a question. Um, Pertaining to what they think you heard, what they think they heard you say about one major mowing a year. What time of year is that? Just for clarification. Um, it's for shoulder mowing, usually and typically on the highways, it's twice a year, actually. Um, and it's, it's as we're able to. But um, as far as the interior areas, the wide areas that we're not mowing in, we'll wait till late fall. Like I think this last year, they waited till November in some places or the, the following early spring, if again, the ground conditions warrant. It's springtime is a very early, early spring is a great time to mow. It's just our challenge is the wetness of the ground, getting actually getting access to the location without getting stuck. <laughs> so, okay. and that depends year to year on what, what you're gonna have for ground conditions. Okay, great. And someone else is curious if you're ever looking for new sites, particularly they're hoping you're gonna, you will look more at the southeastern part of the state um, in New London. Yes, I am always uh, taking note of sites that could work. I'm, I'm open to, our contact info was on that last slide there. I'm open to, uh, feel free to email me if you have ideas of locations. Um, Again, it is has to be a little bit discretionary as to the size of the location, uh, accessibility, uh, ground conditions are, if it's a really wet site, sometimes we just need to mow it when we can mow it, period. Um, other sites that are dry, sandy soil, um, we have a lot more flexibility with those. Okay. And then I have two more about invasive species. Um, so one, is about mile a minute. If you have any plans for combating mile a minute, um, we have we have attempted that. There are there's a place right on the Wilbur Cross that uh, we have worked at numerous times, and of course it just keeps coming back. It's it didn't originate on our property. It originated privately and it's approached over and on the southbound side. Plus, it's also worked its way over to the northbound side within the. Uh, the name escapes me right now, but it's within the, uh, the state park, the DEP state park over there. It's one of the linear parks. So yes, we are working at that one. It's There's another location in uh, Wood, Woodbury, I believe it is, on Route 67 that we're aware of that uh, 
we have looked at numerous times. And then someone else has the uh, question, if you'd considered using goats as a means for controlling invasives. Yes, it, that it, has been, that, <laughs> I know, I don't know if other state agencies have done that. I, I, I know some have tried that. And of course, goats have no aversion to anything, they'll eat whatever, yeah. which is great, but I don't know how that would work so much on a state highway system. Yeah, I don't know if we'd be able to set up uh, goat farms in our maintenance <laughs> facilities. I don't think that'd go over too well, but uh, yeah, we, we've actually uh, read some uh, examples and research and stuff about hearing about that. So uh, yeah, I would say, I don't think we have anything in the foreseeable future, no. And then another suggestion too is, um, have you thought of using short native grasses to be planted under guardrails instead of using pesticides? Yes, that's a good point. So within some of our projects now, we are trying the low-mo um, uh, grass mixes, actually right on the Merritt Parkway, we tried some in the media just recently. So we're monitoring that at the moment. And we want to, uh, based on the outcome of that, we want to, if we could result, we want to expand that further, yes, definitely. Okay, great. And then one person just has a question to clarify the 15 foot mowing policy um, and just concerned that that's not adhered to. Just wanted to comment on that enforcement there. Okay, it's it's not adhered to or is it adhered to? What, is that a question or? Uh, they want a comment on um, the concern that the 15 foot mowing policy isn't always adhered to. Okay. Um, are they talking about secondaries or highways? That would be my question. Now that's a great question. You can see if Mary will respond. Back. The second, I'm not referring to, I should have clarified, I'm not referring to secondaries for that. That would be just along the highways. Okay, I'll see if Mary gives any clarification. Okay. On that point. Yeah. So Adam, I have a question about, um, you know, in the effort to try to keep uh, deer and maybe birds away from the roadway, um, do you have to kind of curate the appropriate grasses or shrubs that are not attractive to deer and birds to keep them out of danger and not running across the roadway? We, to date, we haven't really, I know those are you know, considerations, but we have not catered so much to date about that. What, what we have found is where we've, where we've cut back and where we've had more meadow establishment. And again, this, I've seen this myself along the Wilbur Cross and the Merritt. I, I've noticed less deer crossing the road. I see them in the meadows further from the road because we've given them a location to be aside from 10, 15 feet from the edge of the road, they're now further in because they do like to be along the woods line. Mm. So when we achieve the clear zone or we create that meadow effect, that park-like setting, we find them further back right along the woods line than right against the road looking to cross the road. So, and we found that on 91 some years ago when we cut the far less deer strikes, uh, we were not, you know, just to be honest, totally, we were not able to correlate directly that this was related to our tree cutting, but it wasn't an actual result that our maintainers noticed, you know, right away that far less deer strikes, far less carcasses we had to pick up, up the, out there. So wow. That's interesting. Yes. Positive side effect. <laughs> and oh, the right. other thing I wanted right. to ask, because I, I I see that Abby has another another question here. Um, uh, down in, in Darien, we had been talking about um, a site where there's going to be a temporary storage of soil. And we had toyed with the idea of using an annual ecotype like partridge pea or something like that. Um, and, and, and the thought that the DOT properties could become founder plots for the ecotype project in, in that sense of generating seed for us to propagate for sale or to create a seed mix like a native Connecticut's ecotype seed mix. So, um, so my question is, I've, you know, have you thought a little bit about um, going forward with generating your own seed mix? 
um, using ecotypes? That that is certainly a possibility. It would it would be, you know, obviously run through a higher level than I am, but we would we are certainly game to consider that. Yes. Yep. Okay. We have a location. Speaking of Partridge Key, it's uh, Route One Hundred and Ten in Bridgewater. That uh, is a large slope area. Of course, trees were planted on it as well, but as a cover and to, to establish it, the Partridge Key was planted all over that slope and it's really beautiful. Down by uh, Lake uh, Lolanona, I want to say. Yeah, am I correct on that? I believe you yeah. are. So um, the, that Partridge Key is mostly in our conservation scene for slope spec and we see a lot of good success with that on a lot of our design and construction projects. Okay, that's great. Um, there's a there's yes. a question here that I'm just uh, I'll ask because um, I know who's asking it, um, and I had mentioned that there are some friends uh, from New York that are on this call, and they are asking: Do the different state DOTs share information on a regular basis? That's a great question. We always collaborate and have conversations and share. It, we participate in peer exchange from, we're always reaching out to our neighboring DOTs just to get information on practically, I would say anything. You know, Adam has worked with many of the DOTs I have from an environmental standpoint. We're always bouncing ideas off each other. Um, we definitely utilize our, each agency, you know, especially you know, around the neighboring states for just to um, get ideas. Um, Ashto, is another forum where um, there's different uh, groups, uh, especially on the environmental side, um, where they hold, uh, I think it's uh, like quarterly meetings and sometimes they hold monthly meetings and there's different groups. And uh, I would say, yeah, we're always sharing information with the other DOTs. So if there's uh, anytime any DOT, anyone from another agency wants to talk to us about uh, any of the stuff, we'd be more than willing uh, to share, you know, some of our you know ideas and what we're actually doing. That's great. I know the main DOT um, uh, collaborated with the Wild Seed Project up there and came up with a great uh, spiral booklet on mm -hmm. their roadsides, which I, I think you guys had referenced. So it's important because these are these are large scale corridors and uh, it would be amazing if state after state could begin to um, you know, embed some of these natives back into our landscape. So it's very cool, very cool. Um, yes, so I was working with uh, Bob Mooseman from Maine DOT before oh, he retired. Good he, name. he was very helpful to me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and I see this note from Sephra that Heather McCargo. Now, maybe she's taken over for Bob. I don't know. But um, <laughs> since he retired, I haven't reached out to anybody up there. But he was, again, he was a great help to me. Yeah, Heather is the, um, the founder of the Wild Seed Project in me. Uh, oh, okay, right. okay. Yeah. Um, so I think Abby, you got a comment back from Mary about what she was. Uh, yeah, so Mary just responded. So she is um, just expressing the public perception on the highways that the 15 foot mowing policy is not always adhered to. So just making a comment about that. I'm curious if you have something to okay. comment on. I don't know what your thought, Adam, but I think when, so the vegetation management guidelines, those came into effect, what, 2018, 2018. So I, I, I think Adam, and I'll speak in, at any time, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, quite frankly, our, I think our maintainers were always in the mindset to mow everything down. And we did make that adjustment to, to a reduced mowing practices. You know, I, I think it was, it was, it was definitely a lot of training that needed to be done um, and just try to get our maintainers out of the mindset. You don't need to mow everything down. There's a benefit to it. And, uh, you know, there's a benefit, obviously, from the pollinator standpoint, but there's also a benefit from a, uh, you know, a maintenance and operations standpoint um, from the maintenance of utilizing the equipment, less wear and tear on the equipment, uh, less uh, fuel for the equipment. Um, I think it was just more of the training education component that we had to work yeah. on with our folks. Yeah, area. that could be part of it here. The other aspect is if, if it's a narrow area under 60 feet or um, 
again, if it's a wet area or prone to be wet, they may just mow it when they're able to in entirety uh, because there's limited opportunity to get in there to do that. So um, I don't know exactly where this location is, but I'm just trying to guess at what might be going on out there. That really links to that. I really like that Jeff Castor quote that you shared with us that the yes. over there, let's just not mow them down. So yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I do have one final question. Um, so someone's just curious if there's any plans for DOT to eradicate the autumn olive that's in Ridgefield and Danbury. It's at the route seven slash 84. And curious if um, you'll replant with native grasses. Seven and 84 interchange. Mm -hmm. uh, we've recently done quite a bit of work out there. Uh, autumn olive, um, I know there's a lot of pine trees along those ramps too. And that, well, I guess it's just west of 7 and 84. Um, but yeah, autumn olive is a challenging one. What, what we typically do is try to mow it down with our, either a bobcat or our over the fence. I shouldn't say over the fence, we use a, an excavator with a, a mini excavator with a forestry head on it. Uh, it's a really, of course, you know, it's a very tough plant. So you really need to use mechanization to deal with it because of its, uh, well, it's, it's toughness and the you know, thorns on it and so forth. So, um, but yes, I, I will say we're working at that um, 84 West, right at the exit seven ramp, that point there, um, you'll notice that was an area that was capped off. It was a, a, a site that we were using for excess you know, soil and debris and so forth. We capped that off and shelved it and planted that last year. <clears throat> now that's another area that thinking ahead, and I'll, I'm looking to try that engineered soil media out there as well. It's another area that I think would be a great spot to give that a try. It's, it's designed for areas that have poor soil nutrients value. So it's, this might be a great candidate out there ultimately. Well, thank you so much for all of your insight here and all, answering all the questions. That's everything I have. So I'm going to pass it back on to Mel. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, Kevin and Adam, is it okay for people to um, send you emails if they think of another question uh, later on today? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. That's great. Well, this this was wonderful, and uh, you know we've gotten some great comments from people that um, you know people are very thankful for the work that you're doing, and uh, very interesting and comforting to know because there's been so much work on our roadways, and and when we're not uh, aware of the goal, um, it can be uh, kind of shocking to see the removal of trees. But now that you know, we know that you are having. These, you have these plans and you're doing such great things in our demonstration sites around the state. Um, it's really nice. It's really impressive. So uh, um, I think uh, we all appreciate your coming out today and sharing this with us. Um, I encourage everybody if uh, they can go to the Aspetuck Land Trust um, website and uh, uh, link on to uh, our green corridor and take the pledge and uh, also take a look at our native plant sale. We still have it open and we're selling 37 species of ecotype perennials uh, in our sale. Um, so that have been harvested through the ecotype project in Connecticut NOFA and um, propagated by Planters Choice in Newtown. So, um, so I think that I think that's it. We're we're finishing exactly on time. I like to give an extra fifteen minutes at the end for questions. So, um, thank okay. you, to Adam and Kevin. Um, yes, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you all for it. submitting the uh, the extra sites we can use to reference yeah. uh, plants. That's great, and this is recorded too. So, um, yes, people, perfect. So, if people weren't able to join in, they can uh, they can go on to our website and and click on there. So thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. And thanks to the Connecticut DOT. We're really proud of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You all have a great day now. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.